Helena McMonagle, and I told her she's my guinea pig. She's our first speaker in the series. And she works at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in a lab that is doing a project called the Twilight Zone. She's going to start off by telling you a little bit about herself, a lot about her project, and then there will be time at the end to ask questions, which I hope you will do. So I will hand it over to Helena. Thank you, Deb. I uh, oh, haven't spoken in a microphone for a while, so can I, I'm assuming everyone can hear me. Is it too loud? All right, so yeah, my name's Helena. Thanks for taking time out of your day to come learn about the Twilight Zone. Uh, so just to briefly talk about how I got here, um, I wanted to be a vet since I was about five years old. I uh, then got to high school, didn't really know what I wanted to do, um, wasn't sure if I wanted to go to vet school. I uh, thought maybe I wanted to be a teacher, thought I wanted to be an engineer, got to college, started off as a Spanish major. And I do still speak some Spanish, it has come in, in use in my work, but uh, I decided to go into environmental biology. I took a class that just really hooked me and I I realized that I, I really care about environmental issues and I think it's something that is important to talk about with the general public as well. So uh, I became a bio major and then my first job out of college was um, right here in Falmouth in Woods Hole. Great. So let's get started. Um, I want to briefly mention that these photos uh, of, the, of these fish over here are um, Yeah, if we could have the lights down, that would be great. Yeah. Thanks. But maybe even just at the front so we can see the photos better. And also, if you guys have questions throughout the talk, please feel free to just raise your hand and I'll see you and uh, we can make this a little more interactive. All right, so yeah, these, these photos, I want to give credit, are taken not by me, but by um, a scientist in our lab named Paul Cager. He's from New Zealand. Um, he's a postdoc, meaning he finished his PhD and is now working as a scientist at Hui. Uh, so in a way, he's sort of an artist as well, because I think these are really cool photos. Oh, yeah, please. Um, we have a little Twilight Zone to pass around, that I almost, uh, Twilight Zone fish to pass around. Uh, this is a mctophid. If you look, you'll see it has pretty big eyes. There's a couple other smaller mctophids in there. And if you look along its ventral side, its belly, you'll see it has these little tiny points of light, which are bioluminescent photophores. All right, here's a mctophid up here too, and we'll get started. So what is the twilight zone? First of all, does anyone already know what the twilight zone is? Or have some idea? Go ahead. Awesome, so um, I'm impressed that you guys have heard of it. So it is indeed a, a layer of ocean in between the light zone and the dark zone. So the light zone, um, is, we call the euphotic zone or the epipelagic zone. So this is where you guys will see fish that you like to eat. What are some fish that you like to eat or that you know you see in seafood restaurants? Cod. Cod, yep, for sure. Salmon. Salmon, yep. Swordfish, so you can see a swordfish up here. These are all animals that live in the euphotic zone. So we're probably more familiar with that part of the ocean, right? But if we dive down, and we go to, let's start from the surface. We go down 30 meters. That's about as deep as scuba divers can go. Then we keep going. Now we're at 200 meters. At this point, there's, there's not enough light for photosynthesis to take place. So how many of you have taken a bio class in school so far? All right, so you probably all are familiar with photosynthesis, right? So so like, like um, trees do, microscopic plants in the ocean called phytoplankton, some of them are much bigger than microscopic, like kelp, they take up um, sunlight, they uh, also use up carbon dioxide, and they release oxygen, right? And, um, and these microscopic plants make up the base of the food web, just like they do on land. Um, so there's basically a lot more food at the surface of the ocean, which is why we have salmon, swordfish, cod, all these fish that we like to eat. But if you go deeper, once you get to 200 meters, all the way down to 1,000 meters, mm -hmm. you reach a part of the ocean that is not completely dark, but it's almost dark. It's called the twilight zone. So um, if you go below that, past about 1,000 meters, you get into the midnight zone, which, as your classmate pointed out, is completely dark. So you might recognize some of these animals. You've probably heard of jellies, right, or jellyfish. Uh, we have squid in the twilight zone, shrimp, 
But a lot of these are different species than what we might see if we were to go to Stony Beach or you know, Silver Beach or whatever and, um, and look for critters. All right, so I wanna talk about a major process that happens in the twilight zone. Has anyone heard of diel vertical migration? There's a big long term. A couple of you have heard of it? Okay, cool, that's awesome. So basically diel vertical migration is called diel because it happens twice a day. It's called vertical because these animals migrate vertically from the twilight zone up to the surface. And it, it, it is indeed a migration. It's the largest migration on the planet actually. Um, the largest animal migration. So basically, um, this image goes from daytime, right? We're at noon, we're at lunchtime. These twilight zone animals all across the globe are down deep in the twilight zone where it's almost completely dark. Then the sun sets, right? Every day when the sun sets, thousands and thousands, millions, probably billions of animals move up to the surface of the ocean. Why do you think they go to the surface at night? Why would they make this huge migration twice a day? It takes a lot of energy, right? Why would they bother doing that? Um, because it'll be harder, harder to see them at night. Exactly. They can they can hide under the cover of darkness from predators, right? And they can go up to these surface lit waters where we have lots of photosynthesis, lots of um, lots of food at the base of the food web, which fuels the rest of the food web up at the surface. So so sun goes down. Twilight zone animals go up. As you can see, not all of them migrate. Some actually do stay in the twilight zone, but a lot of them migrate, and then as the sun starts coming up, we're eating breakfast, they're all diving back down. Um, so this is a huge process. Again, it happens worldwide. It happens right off the coast where we live here, anywhere that there's water deeper than about 200 meters. But who cares about that? It's way offshore. We're probably not going to get to go into the twilight zone. You might if you get to dive in Alvin or um, one of the submersibles we have here in, in your hometown, which is amazing. Um, but I want to talk about why we should all care, even if we never get to go there or see it in person. All right, there's two reasons that I want to, I really want to emphasize that I think we should care about the Twilight Zone. Uh, and I'm not alone in that. So one of those is mitigating climate change. Anyone feel like this is something we should care about? I think so, yes. So mitigating just means alleviating or doing something to lessen the effects of climate change. And you might be thinking, how does the twilight zone have anything to do with fixing climate change? Well, it's not gonna fix the problem, but it does actually affect the problem. So I wanna uh, talk about that in a minute. Second reason, um, we talked a little bit about seafood. You guys pretty quickly had some ideas of, of seafood that we eat. So it turns out that the twilight zone could provide a source of food that maybe we haven't really started tapping into yet. Um, and I'll talk about that secondly. But these are the two main reasons um, uh, sort of affecting climate change in a positive way and providing food that I think is important to uh, study and better understand the twilight zone. All right, let's start with climate, the climate change issue. Anyone know what, what these things are? These little tiny green things? They're microscopic. This is from a a microscope, yeah. Mm -hmm. What kind of plankton, you know? So you're right, it is absolutely plankton. We would call it phytoplankton. So phyto, like plant, right? Um, so these are these microscopic plants I was talking about. There's so many different types, but here you can see it kind of looks like a kaleidoscope. There are some diatoms, some dinoflagellates. These are all different types of phytoplankton. All right, now what eats phytoplankton? You're very close. The, the whales eat the thing that eats the phytoplankton. As far as I know, I think that there's one layer in the food web right in between. Does anyone know what that layer is between the phytoplankton and something like a whale? Shrimp. Shrimp, yes, you're right. Shrimp are, are one of many different types of zooplankton. So it would go phytoplankton, zooplankton, and then things like fish, whales, larger um, predators. So. Here's what we might think of when we think of plankton. I got this a lot. Is this really what plankton look like? Well, it's not too far off. There's a, <laughs> there's a copepod, which is somewhat related to a shrimp, as you said. Um, but copepods are possibly the most abundant uh, invertebrate on the planet. Anyone know what an invertebrate is? Right, an 
animal without the backbone, right? So we are not invertebrates, we are vertebrates. We'll talk more about some vertebrates in a second. Uh, so, so these little copepods, these guys, and, and shrimp and other types of zooplankton, graze on these plants, these phytoplankton, kind of like a cow grazes on grass. These, these guys graze all over the ocean on these phytoplankton, at least at the surface of the ocean. Oh. <clears throat> all right. But how does this have anything to do with climate change? Well, we've probably heard something about how rainforests take up carbon, right? So rainforests, uh, you know, and, and trees and grass and, and all of these land plants, they take up carbon dioxide, right? They use that, car that carbon dioxide, that inorganic carbon, to make carbohydrates, sugars, things like that. Um, and then they release oxygen, right? So I want to take a, I'm gonna take a quick moment. I'm gonna be really corny here, and I want everyone to breathe with me just twice. It only takes a second. All right, ready? So on the count of three, breathe in. One, two, three, and breathe out. <laughs> and breathe in. And breathe out. Okay, so one, the oxygen from one of those two breaths came from the ocean, it turns out. So what I'm saying is that half the oxygen that we breathe is coming from these phytoplankton that are eaten by zooplankton that are eaten by larger animals. Well, like you said, when the sun goes down, these twilight zone animals come up, and what do they do? They're munching down on these phytoplankton, these zooplankton, these organisms that have taken carbon out of the atmosphere, the carbon dioxide that the, you know, things like fossil fuels are putting into the atmosphere, and they're, and they're getting it into their bodies, and then what do they do when the sun comes up? They go down, right? So with them, they bring, in their stomachs, from everything they've, they've chowed down on that night, they're bringing with them all that carbon into the deep sea. And here, it, that carbon might remain for hundreds or even thousands of years, and that's a process called carbon sequestration. Now, I want to make it clear that the ocean would do this without twilight zone animals, but these twilight zone animals basically speed up that process of carbon sequestration in the ocean. So that's another reason why we should care about the ocean in general. But um, you can imagine these animals go up, right? They, they eat a bunch of food, they come back down, they bring that carbon with them. Now I have a second question. Why, why wouldn't that carbon just go right back up to the surface the next day when they migrate back to the surface? Why is it that that carbon is staying in the deep sea and it's being sequestered? What do you guys think? What's causing it to stay down in the twilight zone or maybe sink even deeper? Yeah, that's, so that is something these animals have to deal with, right? It's pressure changes. So a lot of them will have swim bladders that they can rip off gas to get rid of gas or um, when they get down to deeper pressure or they might not have swim bladders at all. But that doesn't really explain why carbon um, is staying down, dissolved. I mean, it, it, it's dissolved, so the pressure doesn't affect it so much. Um, that doesn't really explain why it's staying down in the twilight zone. So I'll, I'll tell you why. It's because they come down, and what do they do? Just like we do, we breathe out, right? We breathe in oxygen, we breathe out carbon dioxide. So that's one way. They're releasing carbon dioxide down into the twilight zone. Another way is simply that they're pooping. I mean, literally. So this, so, <laughs> so these animals are coming down. They've eaten their full meal at the surface, right? And then they're, they're pooping, and, and a lot of that, um, we'll call it fecal pellets, we come up with some scientific term for it, a lot of those fecal pellets will sink to the bottom of the ocean, and that is bringing carbon, again, from the surface, from the atmosphere, from the shallow waters into the deep sea. Also, oh, 15 minutes? All right, I'll keep moving. Um, thanks, Deb. So yeah, another thing is that some of these animals will, will just die, and, and that, again, will sink carbon down into the deep sea. All right, so the second reason we mentioned why the twilight zone is important is to provide food. Um, so this is maybe the type of seafood that we usually think of eating. Um, and these are the twilight zone animals. So here's a few examples. This is the mctophid, which is a different species, but closely related to the one that you guys are passing around. There's a lot of species of mctophid. This is a fang tooth, a little skinny snipe eel, and these are hatchet fish. And you can see them all in the palm of my hand. They're all pretty small, right? And that's about as big as they get um, related to my hand, those hatchet fish. So basically, these, 
these animals aren't about to show up on your dinner plate, right? They're not particularly appealing. They're mostly tooth and, and heads, and, and they're just not that big. But um, it turns out that a lot of different companies and even entire countries like Norway are investing millions of dollars in figuring out how we can tap into this resource as a twilight zone in order to, to get food. But I, I've just said that we're not going to be eating probably mesoplagic or, or twilight zone animals um, uh, on our dinner plate, but you could potentially use them for omega-3 fatty acids. Like if you've been in CVS and seen krill oil, um, that could be coming from the twilight zone. Trace. Uh, minerals like selenium, or we could be using it for fish meal to feed farmed fish that are used in aquaculture. All right, if you want to learn more about some of the research questions we're studying, uh, there's a TED talk that a really awesome scientist named Heidi at Hui, um, her kids went to FHS, uh, she gave this talk, and um, basically we're, we're trying to figure out this system in the Twilight Zone before we start fishing it, before we start changing the resource by using it, right? So um, some of the questions we're asking are really basic, like who is eating who? And how much carbon are they bringing down from the surface? Um, these, are, these are questions that I think it's important to understand as scientists and as the general public before we start really using this resource. We're sort of on the brink of beginning to fish in the twilight zone. All right, so I wanna talk about really, maybe just for a couple minutes, how do we survive in the twilight zone? How do these animals survive? So uh, one, one thing to note is that in terms of feeding, they have some really cool adaptations. A lot of them have really huge teeth because you're not gonna come across food as often in the twilight zone because there just isn't as much biomass, as much living matter down there. So basically, when you find your food, you wanna grab onto it and not let it go because um, you might not get another chance for a while. You'll also see some of them have these lures with a light on at the end um, to lure their prey over. And a lot of them just aren't picky eaters. They'll pretty much eat whatever comes their way. Um, all right, counter illumination. So this is another really cool process. Can we turn off the lights, please, just for a second? Thanks.
case people ask about field work or anything. So I would say my work is about 30% doing lab work, dissecting fish, working with pipettes, these fancy syringes we use to study things like DNA, they're really small. And um, about 30% of it is on a computer, analyzing data, writing, there's a lot of writing in science. And probably 30% or maybe a little less is, um, is doing uh, field work. So that's actually my favorite part. I, I was drawn into this field because I, I didn't want to have a purely office job. And so I love that we get to go on all these cruise ships and we catch fish in a variety of ways. This was a cruise last summer, not so far from here, about 200 miles south of the vineyard. And just real quick, we use these big machines that um, find fish using acoustics, kind of like a whale does with echolocation. Uh, I'm just gonna flip through real quick. We use these huge nets to catch the zooplankton that we just were talking about. I have a really fine mesh. There's a whole mess of slime, which is zo all the zooplankton, kind of all piled up there that we caught in the net. Then we also use these midwater trawls. These aren't so different than what the fishing industry would use, but we use much smaller ones and we're just sampling here and there. We're not, you know, we're not extracting the resource. Um, yeah, so, so that's sort of what our work looks like every day is different, which is another thing that I really like about my job. Do we have questions? Yes. Where did you go to college? Um, I went to Wellesley College, which is not far from here, about 12 miles west of Boston. And I, I ended up switching from a science major to biological sciences literally halfway through college. I had an internship which was doing outreach for an environmental um, nonprofit, and I just loved that work and really became curious about science even though it, I never thought I would be a scientist when I was in high school. I wasn't even really thinking about that at all, actually. Lady, can you talk about health start? <laughs> okay. Okay.
in the layers to be catching what they want specifically. That's not to say that this layer is made of one species. It's probably made of hundreds of species. So it will be hard, I think, to avoid bycatch, which is accidental catch um, when it's catching. And when you get the fish that's in there, can you just pick up your little shell? Is this a representative um, size? Is that right? Like, yeah. Not, oh, is this a larva or is this an adult? This is an adult. So these tiny little guys that you saw are, they're juveniles. They're like, not quite babies, so they're not larvae, but they're like young adults. But this big guy, he might not get a lot, a lot bigger. So um, again, these fish would probably be like ground up to make fish meal, to feed things like salmon that we're, talk, we're farming, or to, to extract out um, nutritional supplements like omega-3 fatty acids that are really healthy for us to eat. Um, good question. A lot of people, I think, seem skeptical when we think about fishing in this pilot zone, but uh, in fact, people are already investing a lot of money in figuring out whether we can tap into this resource. Um, I'll just really quickly mention, um, I, yeah, so I'm, I'm planning on going to grad school next year, which again, was not even on my radar when I was in college. Um, and I'm going out to Seattle to study biological oceanography in sort of a fisheries department, because I'm, I'm kind of equally interested in the issues of climate change and fishing, but uh, the Twilight Zone kind of allows me to study both. So I'm planning on pursuing that uh, as, as a, a master's student and potentially as a PhD student someday. Um, yeah, so I, I deferred for a year because I didn't want to leave Falmouth because I love where you guys live. <laughs> so I'm waiting a year and I'll go in, in the summer. Any other questions real quick? So most of the funding at Huey, like 80%, comes from um, public money. So taxpayer money that goes to the government and then is is uh, basically redistributed um, for scientific research. It's really hard to get these grants. Most grants that we write are denied, but um, most money comes from um, from taxpayer money, from all of us investing in science. Um, but uh, this particular project is unique because a lot of it actually comes from um, philanthropists. So, I mean, some of these people that have funded this project are like Bill and Melinda Gates and, and hedge fund investors and TED Talks and um, like executives of eBay. I mean, it's all these people that decided, hey, we, we have a lot of money and we actually want to donate it to science and we think this is, now is the time to start studying um, these questions. So, um, so that's where the, this, this project is primarily privately funded, which is, which is pretty unusual, but does happen. I totally see your point, and I think that I think that we really need to 
understand the system before we start harvesting it so that we can create policies 